I think it's personally amazing. So this would be like video consultations. I'm pretty biased because this is how I see clients 95% of the time. There are some circumstances where it would be better to see the person in person. So if it's like a chiropractor, obviously, or you're someone who does like muscle testing or likes to use the naturopathic diagnosis. I sometimes just ask my clients to like talk me through the nails, the tongue, all of that. But I think it's absolutely amazing to be able to work with someone halfway across the world and get just as results as seeing them in person. And especially if someone has kind of chronic illness, they're really tired, they're working full time, they've got a busy household that they need to run, like mothers, then it's amazing they could just hop online in their pajamas. Vertical ridges would be the most common and I see that being due to weak digestion. So whether that's infection in there, low stomach acid, could also be a sign of protein and B vitamin malabsorption. And I have a whole episode on this. It's 52 of the Hormones in Harmony podcast. It can definitely be triggered by excessive heat and also cold exposure, but maybe it's the pollen as well, because where I am, I know, and in the East Coast of America, the pollen is really bad. So you might have like a seasonal allergy and um, just adding to your histamine bucket as well. There are some things that you can do to just bring down histamine. I sometimes just have to take an antihistamine um, tablet, just an over-the-counter one, just to get some symptomatic relief. But there are natural alternatives like quercetin, nettles, you can do vitamin C. I like to brew a big pot of herbal tea, including tulsi or holy basil, nettle, things like chamomile, which are all very antihistamine and sometimes green juicing. So using like cucumbers, celery, fresh herbs like parsley, coriander can really help. But I'd also recommend trying to figure out the root cause as well, because some people just have a genetic predisposition to having high histamine levels, that's completely fine. But if it's really affecting you and it's causing other health issues, then look into some of the root causes, could be gut health, detoxification, nutrient deficiency. I use the brand Seeking Health, and it, that is a US brand, but you can get it, I think, readily available um, in the UK and other places. So look at that one. That's the one that I use for electrolytes. I'm really not a fan. It's not actually addressing the root cause of the problem. Um, I would actually prefer someone to do a topical antibiotic if I'm, on, if I'm honest, because if you're taking it internally, it's going to affect the gut health overall and actually make you more at risk of developing acne again. It might help temporarily bring down the bacterial load, but it's not actually addressing the root cause because if you've got slow motility, thyroid issues, you've got other parasites and things going on, the bacteria is just going to keep proliferating because your immune system's weak. And there are other causes. As well. There are other causes to acne, like food sensitivities. It could be hormonal. It could be due to liver detoxification. So an antibiotic isn't actually dealing with any of those problems. And like I said, it's just making the issue worse in the long run. Like a lot of people find that um, for it to come back. It's likely due to your androgen levels elevating, which is a normal process around ovulation. Um, your hormones spike in general, but you could just have higher either testosterone, DHEA. Than the average person, you might just be hypersensitive to the, these hormones, even though even though they're in normal amounts. It could be due to sluggish liver detoxification because your hormone levels might be fine, but they could just be um, not being cleared correctly by the liver, causing them to recirculate. Um, they would be the main factors with greasiness, oiliness, acne, those types of issues. I think it can be useful. I sometimes add in blood glucose as well as a good marker for insulin, PCOS, acne, those types of things. I, f I do find people get a little bit obsessive with some tracking, so I have to kind of decide who I think would benefit because it can sometimes become more of a stress to certain people. With the temperature tracking, people are pretty familiar with it when they're trying to conceive or they're looking for a non-hormonal form of contraception. They do the basal body temperature ch uh, charting and that will show like ovulation. It can also give insight into thyroid and metabolic health if your temperatures drop below like 36.6 degrees, for example. Um, and heart pulse rates, I sometimes do in terms of tracking for food sensitivities, food reactions, but not as often. So warts are usually driven by viruses, and we're all probably exposed to these viruses just in our day-to-day -day life, but it's when your immune system becomes suppressed that these viruses actually can take over in certain cases and reappear. And this could be due to antibiotics, things like antibiotic cues, chronic stress. Um, so I would approach it from like an internal perspective, but you can do things topically, like freezing them to get rid of them, but it's not actually addressing the root cause. Low pancreatic elastase is due to low enzymes coming from the pancreas that help to digest proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. So that tells me that there's some stress in the body because when you're stressed, your body doesn't need to put a ton of energy into digesting your food properly. So it's 
remember stress isn't just mental emotional although that is a huge piece because when you're in that fight and flight sympathetic mode you're not going to be in a rest and digest parasympathetic so working on mindful eating stress management but also looking at hidden stressors that could be infections do you have do you have parasites or h pylori in the gut which could just be causing some stress and messing with your whole gut flora um, maybe some digestive enzymes could help, but working with a practitioner to make sure that you find the, the right formulation for you. So there is a part two to this question. She then asks, um, she then says that she's finding it difficult to actually do the self-care things because of the stress and anxiety. I would first say um, I'd work with some sort of therapist to work through any emotional blockages, um, tra traumas in the past. You can start on some things on your own, like emotional freedom technique or EFT, some journaling, meditation, but I'm sure you've tried all of those things. So it's worth working with someone on these things one on one just to help you overcome them because it can be difficult to it can be difficult to do on your own. And then just some just start very simple. Just try drinking some herbal tea like chamomile to kind of calm the body and the nervous system down. Can you go out for a ten minute walk once a day in the sunlight and do some deep breathing in nature? Can you go to bed? half an hour earlier all of these things may seem very simple and like they're not going to be effective but they definitely are and i know it seems very overwhelming when you're dealing with mental health issues or you're at the start of your health journey because everyone's kind of talking about all of these elaborate protocols for neurotransmitters and you have to go to all of these fancy things for self curb it can just be very simple just all start there but i do recommend working with someone on this situation if you mean naturopathic doctor, they don't actually really exist in the UK unless they've trained overseas. Um, so if you mean like a naturopathic practitioner like myself, um, yes, yeah, so send me a DM and I'll give you some recommendations. Potentially in a couple of ways. So it can just dry out the hair, make it more brittle. Um, that's less common that it would just completely fall out from that unless you're excessively swimming in the pool all the time. But the fluoride can actually, uh, the chlorine, sorry, can actually displace ID in the body because it's a halogen and that can therefore impact your thyroid function and when your thyroid is sluggish or overactive that can cause hair loss as one of the main symptoms so yes but in an indirect way it can be um, depends on where the pain is situated situated if it's near the bottom and kind of in the pelvic area then that would just be regular menstrual cramps which can be due to higher estrogen or deficiency or lack of progesterone to balance that if it's actual stomach pain, so higher up after eating, you notice it's getting worse. It could just be digestive issues that are flowing up around the time of your cycle. That would be a little bit different. But pain is often due to prostaglandins in the body, which are impacted by the fat type of fat that you eat. There is. It's a little bit more expensive than the HTMA that I use. But for, but for people who don't want to cut their hair off, you can do red blood cell nutrients or minerals. Um, so that would be a blood test. I would take magnesium or up your dosage um, to around five times your body weight in pounds. That's like a therapeutic dose. And start with the magnesium citrate in divided doses because that acts more of a laxative as opposed to magnesium. But other forms you can do kind of mindful eating, digestive enzymes, um, ginger tea with fresh ginger. It's very warming and soothing and it can help with um, reducing inflammation in the gut. And then I would also look at liver detoxification. It could just be that there's excessive hormones and that's kind of burdening the liver backing up your digestion a little bit um and other minerals as well so magnesium um, b vitamins those types of things you can do topical things but i find it being very difficult to treat unless you're addressing it from the inside out as well so um, tea tree oil applied topically you can do apple cider vinegar soaks of the nail um which is also antifungal if you have other symptoms that could indicate that there's some sort of fungal infection inside then i would test that with something like an organic acid test or a gi map and address it from the inside out as well i personally don't use a ton of sunscreen on my body because i'm not outside the uk is not very sunny but if i do go on holiday i've tried to kind of build up my exposure throughout the spring and summer months and then just be in it, the shade um if at the beach or something all day if i am outside just walking about in the summer months in the uk or when i'm on holiday i will use the sunscreen on my face if i'm going to be out for longer than like half an hour or so which is a mineral zinc based sunscreen not the chemical sunscreens because they are actually linked to skin cancer many of them have terrible ingredients i actually have a blog post on um how, why to ditch your conventional sunscreens on my blog and um babies 
yeah, it's hard to say everyone's a little bit different in terms of their beliefs. Just day to day, I probably I probably wouldn't with my kids in the future because we didn't kind of evolve with sunscreen. We would have just been safe with exposure and just build up tolerance. Obviously, don't let them sit and burn. But yeah, just non no sunscreen is perfect. So I choose to use it when possible. But if you're in somewhere like Australia, you live at the beach, you're always outside, then just have common sense and use it if you feel like it's appropriate, but choose a better brand. Not for a while because I really worked on that when my health was really terrible and I was depressed and underweight and never left the house. I had my moment back then um, and I really changed my perception around it and understand that everything was happening for my benefit, not to. I've never kind of like gone off, the fell off the bandwagon with my diet because I enjoy the foods that I eat. Yes, there's been times where it's been very restricted, but I would actually be very symptomatic if I didn't follow that diet. So it was like a necessary thing in my situation. But I think everyone who's struggling with their health has been there at some point, maybe you're currently there. But I always used to reframe it that I wasn't struggling with something life-threatening. There were people in much worse situations than me, people who are terminally ill, and at least there's answers in conditions like I. So magnesium in general is involved in over 500 different enzymes in the body. So if you're lacking magnesium, there's going to be around 500 things that your body can't do well, if at all. Everything from neurotransmitter production to liver detoxification and adrenal health. I'd say for the average person, magnesium glycinate is just a generally good form because it's well absorbed and um, the, it depends on what it's attached to. So glycine helps with relaxation and liver detoxification as well. The form magnesium citrate has kind of citric acid attached to that and that helps more with constipation, um, individuals with really bad digestion and those who need like a laxative effect. And then there's other ones like magnesium malate, which is attached to um, malic acid, which is involved in mitochondrial health, muscular health. So the main one most people should stick with is magnesium glycinate or work towards that. But there could be other uses, it depends. I've never personally used them. I'm not sure if it's like an MLM um, company, so I'm not a huge fan of situations like that. But I feel like the ingredients could be good. I've just never used them personally. I actually don't um, and that's weird like people always ask me for like amazing recipes and meal plans that's just not my thing I used to really like cooking but I think it's because I went through a time and still I'm really with food sensitivities and having to um, eliminate a lot of things that's made me just stick with like basic meals meat to veg pretty much every meal um, so hopefully when my diet expands and I overcome kind of food sensitivities histamine issues I will get back more into cooking but I'm fine having I'm in that exact same situation, so I can totally empathise and relate. So what I've been doing is kind of using an air filter, opening the windows as much as possible, spending as much time outside. So I'd work in my garden sometimes or just go for a walk. You, you can use antioxidant support to combat some of the inflammation that can happen. And you can also use binders, things like glutathione and NAC, but start very slowly. Coffee enemas have been a lifesaver for me as well. Castor oil packs that I don't get. It really depends if it's a mild gluten intolerance because you've got SIBO or your gut's been a little bit messed up, then you could tolerate it. Um, it needs to be organic, re really high quality, and I recommend going to a baker rather than just the local supermarket sourdough. For someone like me who is um, who has like the genetics and autoimmune genes, like celiac genes that haven't been turned on, then I really don't do well with sourdough, even the best quality type. So I personally avoid. Absolutely. And especially if you're reacting to the conventional advice of bone broths, fermented food, um, just regular probiotics, then and you feel worse, then it could be due to histamine, mast cell activation. Um, I see that all the time. Especially if you have more complex or chronic conditions, mold, Lyme, then I always um, look into histamine because like 50% of the time I usually see that there is a factor and there's varying degrees as well. It could be mildly, it just inflames you or quite similar. People literally react to water, the sun, fresh air, so there is a spectrum. Um, but yeah, sensitivity and more allergic type symptoms, so redness, inflammation, itching, puffiness, um, whenever there's systemic symptoms as well, consider I prefer to have them um, instead of a proper breakfast, but it depends on like time and what you're eating. If it's like a little pre-workout um, pre and then you have a full breakfast afterwards, but there is a way to make it big and balanced so that you can get all of your nutrients. 
and that's t what I tend to do. So I have a good quality pea protein by New Zest, um, some hemp seeds in there, a green powder, coconut milk, cucumber, cinnamon. I have a guide for a recipe on my website. And also if you're having a big breakfast and then drinking a big smoothie on the side, that can dilute your stomach acid. So I prefer to separate meals and fluids. And it could just be a little bit too much, especially if you're using like fatty, nutrient dense foods, you could end up overeating, over consuming calories, which aren't a massive deal. But I've never personally dealt with this because I've never, I never run. And especially when on my period, I prefer to do more restorative walking, stretching, those types of things. Your body is already quite depleted during that time. So I personally wouldn't stress it out more with running. It could also um, lessen in heaviness because of the stress response. So your body may just slow down bleeding until you stop running because it's a little bit scared. Your um, mucus and liquids and fluids in the body can dry up a little bit when you're... I mean, it's not going to cause any like major imbalances in the body. If you're just using it like when you're traveling or severely backed up, then I would consider it. But you need to figure out why you're constipated in the first place. If it's just a one-off, then fine. But if it's, if it's becoming more and more frequent, then I would be a little bit concerned. And there are so many other natural things as alternatives. So I'm a big fan of coffee enemas. You can do, um, there's, if you're in the US, there's a brand that does smooth, smooth move tea or high doses of magnesium citrate or vitamin C to get the bowels moving. Um, so there are alternatives, but if Miralax is the only thing that gets your bowels going, then I would stick with that because constipation is not a great thing. Yeah, there's a number of reasons. Um, it can throw off the copper balance in the body. Copper is involved um, in so many things, but it's a Goldilocks nutrient. So too much is a bad thing, but too little can cause other issues. So it could be that you've been taking too much for too long and now your, your copper is starting to reduce. Or it could be that um, zinc is something that slows down aromatase which is the enzyme that converts testosterone into estrogen. So you could be ending up with more testosterone. Um, and I had two fatty lamb chops cooked in the oven, some red cabbage from that was left over from last night. I had a little bit of coconut yogurt, koyo with raspberries, chia seeds, and then a pulsing snack bar. Potentially, so yes, excess estrogen or... Um, higher estrogen relative to progesterone so it could be just a progesterone deficiency um it could be your liver's overwhelmed and burdened so those excess hormones are causing your skin to freak out or an issue with histamine because the times when estrogen is the highest so is histamine and if you've got histamine sensitivity that can cause redness and inflammation and acne for some and the final thing would be high androgen so if you've got pcos your hormones tend to spike at those times as well no i wouldn't recommend consuming tuna really at all if possible maybe like once or twice a month would be max um because it is quite high in mercury because it's a larger more predatory fish and it accumulates more toxins but with just being in the food chain so a simple swap would be um swapping that to tinned salmon sardines mackerel um if you're short on time or you just need to get a lower cost option or you can get frozen fish if that's not available but yeah I don't recommend tuna. I haven't been formally diagnosed or done any of the um, specific mass cell activation lab tests be because you need to get them to the lab very quickly and it's very stressful and very expensive. But just with my own research, my symptoms, my health history, and after consulting with some mass cell and histamine experts, we all really think that I have it. Um, but I don't care about really a formal diagnosis. It just makes sense and it puts the puzzle pieces together as to why I've been so sensitive all these years. If you've definitely timed it and every month it happens at that point, then the only thing I can really think of would be low estrogen or just a little bit of depletion after your period, especially if it's problematic and heavy. Um, but it could just be that it's a coincidence that it's happening. Around. And in fact, your acne is driven by poor gut health, the foods that you're eating. Do you eat a ton of sugar and junk food on your period? And that's causing your skin to break out later. Um, and yeah, just want to know more about how it changes and fluctuates throughout the cycle. Yes, it could be. It could be something up with your teeth, your gums. So definitely check that out with a dentist once the coronavirus issue is over. Um, it could be like gingivitis, a cavity, it could be stomach issue, low stomach acid, H. pylori, SIBO. I did the Great Plains Lab mycotoxin urine panel and I'll post the um, results on the next slide and I'll save this to my mold highlight for you to refer back to, but there's quite a few and one of them in particular is very elevated.
if the low back pains from an injury it could just be that it didn't fully heal you're inflamed and that's flaring up um but if there was no injury there it could be that it's your adrenals or your kidneys so your adrenal glands your stress glands they sit on top of the kidneys so there could be some dysfunction one or both of those organs and when i say dysfunction i don't mean like disease necessarily um but it could just be a mild imbalance they're stressed they're inflamed they're swollen for whatever reason and bone health i would look at your minerals and adrenals again trying to identify if possible what's making you anxious so if you are working at a job that you absolutely hate then maybe try and find another job i know that's easier said than done but it's really not worth your health at the end of the day and i would also recommend really slowing down so if you have to get a lot done in the morning or um, you usually work in office and you've got a long commute try and prepare things the night before get your breakfast ready get your clothes out um get your keys near the door where you know that they're going to be so you're not rushing around because that can cause you might even benefit from just setting your alarm 10 to 15 minutes earlier and even though you're probably going to get more sleep um it just gives you more time to do a 10 minute meditation or drink a cup of herbal tea chamomile or tulsi may be really good for the stress relief side of things um, yeah the combination of the stress um and the hormones it's kind of like being on birth control but like a mega high dose for a period of time you're starting you're stopping um, and just the whole process can be pretty clinical and stressful and you have to and your liver can be kind of burdened and overwhelmed from all of the different medications and it can really burn through or zap a ton of your minerals um, and nutrients in the body all of which are important for fertility but it's completely your choice um, at the end of the day an endocrinologist is a trained like doctor who specialized in just hormones so um, they are just basically centered on hormones, which is great. There's a time and a place, but I look at not just hormones, but the whole body and how everything, how everything's interconnected. Because if you were to suggest that put gut health is driving your hormones to an endocrinologist, they probably wouldn't take you seriously. And um, that's the problem. Everything's very separated in conventional medicine, whereas some like me, um, I, do, I do focus on hormones, but I understand that the whole body's interconnected. So I understand that stress in the brain can be causing hormone imbalances or environmental toxins that we're breathing in can be and plus i'm not a doctor so i don't prescribe i've not been to medical school there would be the differences i recommend doing them in the morning or at least early afternoon ish just whenever you've had your daily bowel movement um if you do them a little bit too late in the evening it can cause a bit of like stimulation not because of the caffeine but because of the detoxification response so the fact that you asked this question tells me that you are maybe enjoying the foods that you're eating and you're maybe feeling restricted with a healthier diet. But the way that you eat should be sustainable long term. So if you're currently feeling um, in, a really in a really restricted place and you're telling yourself that certain foods are good, certain foods are bad, certain days are cheat meals, certain days are on plan, that's making you more likely to crave some of those foods and have that in your mind all the time because we're told we think that we can have these things. So why not just incorporate some of those foods that you like every now and again, balance that out with healthy meals so then you, you don't feel like you have on and off days because that is a bad trap to fall into. It works both ways. So hormone imbalances can lead to miscarriage, potentially um, low thyroid, but definitely low progesterone levels. Um, and then having been pregnant and then lose that pregnancy, unfortunately, there's going to be hormonal fluctuations because your estrogen and progesterone rise quite significantly when you fall pregnant to sustain the baby's life. And then obviously when that doesn't work out, your hormones levels drop, so that can lead to some fluctuations. Plus the whole stress of it, cortisol can affect your hormones moving forward. Maybe not, it's very hard to say. If the pill is causing hair loss, which it can, there's certain types. If it's got a synthetic progestin in there, maybe the pill's acting more as an androgen than a progesterone. So that's maybe where you're experiencing hair loss. So if you came off, it could be that the hair loss stops, but coming off it is going to be the only way you can tell. But if you do experience more hair loss, it could just be a temporary thing due to the hormonal fluctuations that you had. Um, so the only way to find out is to prepare your body and then transition safely off the pill. I personally see in clinically that working on liver detoxification um, really helps with those up and down temperatures. I think I first heard this from an acupuncturist. They were saying that ups and downs is very liver centered so maybe working into that and making sure that you're doing things to promote ovulation which are usually the very basic things of a nutrient dense diet managing your stress working on gut health exercising not too much not too little avoiding environmental toxins looking at your thyroid those types of things 
I'm currently dealing with this situation, so just trying to get outside as much as possible. I have a garden so I can go into the garden and work on my laptop um, when I'm not seeing clients. I can go for walks daily, I can keep the windows open, use an air filter. And I'm also taking immune support and binders. I'm doing coffee enemas two to three times a week just to help keep, keep the burden down, just to make sure that I can still function and not being too stressed and kind of anxious about the whole situation because that makes it worse. You've got to identify identify and address the root cause of the problem. So SIBO is a symptom of something deeper, it's not the problem. So is it lack of bile flow, gall gallbladder and liver dysfunction? Is it hypothyroidism, so the motility isn't optimal? Is it heavy metals or something like mold, lime, um, some of like Epstein-Barr virus, some of these more complex things that's causing these issues to recur? If you've done the protocol once or twice and it's still a problem, you need to look deeper. Yeah, this is such a common problem and I think with type A people like myself, Virgos, perfectionist, I can really relate to this situation and I think it's just about letting go of control. We can't control certain things in life but we can just keep learning about our bodies and pivoting along the way and understanding that it's not a linear path, the journey to healing, it's ups and downs, it's two steps forward, three steps back kind of a approach. Sometimes I like to recommend writing a letter to yourself. The idea that you're feeling pretty good, not when you're down and depressed, and maybe making a list of things that make you happy and just give yourself a little bit of a pep talk in that letter. And then on the days that you're feeling down, you can refer to that. You don't have to show anyone. And just that keeps you kind of motivated on a track. A lot of the times, yes. But I've had the situation where um, a few years ago, I figured out the whole a whole um, histamine problem for myself and I went on a low histamine diet and then within a week my skin was clear. I was still kind of a mess internally because I had a lot of problems going on so it can happen like that but a lot of the time your gut, your liver and internal organs need to be functioning optimally before your, your body will put any resources, energy and divert nutrients to the skin because it's not needed for survival at the end of the day. I've had two similar questions on this so I'm going to group them together. So blood pressure rises before her period and it's fine the rest of the time. This could be due to a magnesium deficiency. Magnesium is what causes things to relax, including the blood vessels and arteries. The week before your period, your metabolic rate's higher, you, you need more nutrients and energy. Um, so it could just be that you're lacking in magnesium and then that really intensifies the week before your period because you're burning through a lot of those stores because of the stress that is your menstrual cycle. And I would also consider hormone imbalances, particularly thyroid health, um, high estrogen or low progesterone, that kind of estrogen dominance um, connection, because progesterone is also very anti-inflammatory and helps to dilate and relax. It can, yes, yeah, so it depends on how long you've been taking it for, what dosage, if it's just a small amount in a blend of other things, like a liver support, then it may be fine. But it can definitely help with supporting ovulation and managing androgen levels. So it depends on what's being tested to know for sure. So some people, I advise them to wait before beginning certain herbs and nutrients because we want to see what the baseline is like. But if you are struggling and you really want to just get started, just make a note that the results might be tweaked a little bit. The gold standard way um, above blood testing and all of that is to do a low histamine diet for around two to four weeks. Um, as low as possible, you don't need to completely eliminate them, but try and be as strict as possible. Monitor your symptoms because if symptoms improve, then that's a, that would be a good sign that you're on track. And then to end the whole investigation, you would do a few days of high histamine food. So you can have the chocolate, the spinach, the sauerkraut, the fermented foods. And if your symptoms get worse, within a few days to a week of doing that. Then you've pretty much got your answer, but that's great. You need to then look deeper underneath. Is it that you have nutrient deficiencies, mineral imbalances, estrogen dominance, mold, Lyme, chronic infections that's driving the problem? And I have two blog posts on my website about histamine such. So I had this issue as well when I was in high school. It would feel like this popping sensation and just like there was some bubbles underneath my ribs. It turned out to be, I think, some sort of um, overstretching of the ligaments. It could just be a, a mild injury that you have. I'm not sure. I would rule out something like PCOS if you also have other signs and symptoms that might point towards that. The bottom part of the face can be classically hormones, especially if it's cyclical. So doing all of the basics that I talk about with nutrient-dense diet, regulating blood, managing stress, sleeping well, those types of things. Also supporting liver detoxification with something mild like a herbal tea or a formula to do that. You could also try something topically like a chemical exfoliant to try and prevent the breakouts from happening in the first place.
can definitely increase estrogen depending on how old you are if you're in menopause and that's going to be pretty difficult to do because your ovaries aren't really functioning anymore um it depends on what the cause is as well so i would pr avoid just going in with like a bioidentical without without figuring out what the problem actually is but you can try increasing your intake of fat and um, cholesterol rich foods are the precursor to um, all of our sex hormones I would also look at your thyroid and your adrenals to make sure that they're um, working optimally otherwise your sex hormones otherwise your sex hormones can't I would look at nutrient deficiencies mineral imbalances and also chronic stress gut infections those types of things soy is a phytoestrogen meaning that it weakly binds to the receptor and can um it mimics your own natural type of estrogen so this can be good in postmenopausal when estrogen levels are low it can um, gently increase levels whereas if you're estrogen dominant soy can sometimes be used to sit in that receptor site and block your own natural estrogen from connecting. I'm actually not too sure apart from the basics that we hear about with a fresh razor um, making sure that the area is exfoliated making sure that you're letting it breathe afterwards not putting on like tight underwear right away um, cleaning it beforehand the area of bacteria or sweat build up um, yeah I'm not really sure otherwise I don't think it's like an internal issue although people with sensitive and irritated skin can have this issue more likely you can also try topical things like aloe vera gel and honey so copper is like a goldilocks nutrient you don't want it too high you don't want it too low you want it just in the middle so sometimes you have enough copper and it's just not available to use and maybe because you have an issue with a protein called ceruloplasm due to adrenal stress there's only certain circumstances where i'd suggest a copper supplement because it can be a problem in excess um i rather just someone eat copper rich food which tends to be a lot of the vegetable plant foods um but having too much will having too much would then throw off the copper and zinc ratio and lead to other problems so i think if you're just eating a balanced diet with animal products for zinc and plant foods for copper you're managing your stress your adrenals are pretty healthy copper usually just regulates it really depends on how long you've had it how severe it is and the type of protocol that you're doing some people can just do a couple of weeks on antimicrobials or antibiotic therapy and get rid of it because they're addressing the other root causes whether it's thyroid low stomach acid low back. so that might be in one to two months everyone's good and that's fine Whereas for someone else, say the issue is chronic lime, heavy metals, the SIBO will keep recurring until you deal with those things. And that might be a year or two of a process. Definitely check out the last couple of posts I've done on my feed about acne and testing, because testing's great, but not a lot of people can afford it. And sometimes it's not actually useful because if you know it's hormonal, then just deal with the hormone imbalances. And I've got lots of information on that absolutely not so it could be gut related it may not be hormone related at all could be stress it could be the things that you're putting on your skin like coconut oil could be clogging your pores um so not hormones at all even if it's in this part of the face it may not be related and for that reason you probably don't want to just go to dht blockers because reducing dht too much can lead to other issues as well so you need to rule in or rule out testosterone and androgens as being a problem before you even consider something like a dht blocker Absolutely. So you need to address the root causes, whether that is infection, inflammation, chronic stress, um, high insulin, high blood sugar. Deal with those first before you even look at things like herbs and nutrients, but things like salt palmetto, nettle um, could be used. Thank you. So I studied at the College of Naturopathic Medicine in Manchester, in the Manchester location, um, and that was like the starting point, a three year course. And then obviously after that, for the past few years, I've been doing a lot of extra studying and um, so that's just the starting point mm, not really it can be used as a therapeutic tool from the starting point just to really reduce inflammation especially if there's um yeah chronic inflammation brain related conditions associated it can be a powerful tool but long term i'm not really a fan because you do actually need glucose carbohydrates for adrenal function thyroid function so long term it could actually become more of a problem more of a stress um, and I just don't see it being necessary a lot of the time and you can eat carbs and if you also work on the underlying causes of PCOS, nutrient deficiencies, um, high stress, all of the other things I've just been mentioning. I would def definitely recommend leaving two hours apart either side because it is a binder and it can bind to a lot of different things. So just to be safe, space everything apart from the medication. Depends on the situation. For me, I love smoothies in the morning. It's like a meal. Um, it's packed in with 
a lot of different nutrients in there. Um, whereas juices, I would use them not as frequently of, in my op opinion. Um, it's, there's chronic gut in inflammation and poor digestion because you're lacking a lot of the fiber there, which can be an irritant in cases like inflammatory bowel or cancer. Juices can be great in that um, place, but ideally we want the fiber there as well to slow down the sugar absorption, whether it's even just sugar coming from vegetables. Yeah, it can be, but if you're someone like me with autoimmune um, family history and celiac type gluten sensitivity genes, then I just prefer to stay away from all potential exposures just in case. But it can be for a mild gluten sensitivity, a much better alternative, only if it's organic. So you need to focus on ovulation. So ovulation will naturally bring those FSH and LH markers back into normal range and will keep your androgens in check because when you ovulate, you produce progesterone, which is very um, balancing, very anti-androgenic. And we know that PCOS is just chronic anovulation, so lack of ovulation, lack of progesterone. So I have tons of information on how to start ovulating. I have some Instagram highlights and on my podcast, Hormones in Harmony, some episodes too.